So thanks for, for having me. Um, you can go ahead and pull up the first slide there. So our story here is about uh, our company, Prana, which my wife and I, we started 18 years ago in our garage in Carlsbad, California. A uh, good buddy of mine who's here, uh, DK, took us climbing for the first time and uh, introduced us to yoga, and we just fell in love with it. You know, we, um, we were just so captivated by the simplicity and the soulfulness of it. And, you know, right away, they, there was no separation between yoga and climbing for us. It was, it was all the idea of uh, born from the experience for us. Uh, being present, like Chris was saying, you know, and, and living in the moment, and, and we got that out of climbing and yoga together. So Pam came up with the name Prana in a, a yoga book she was reading at the time, uh, and uh, we loved the simplicity of the word and, and what it meant, and it's, a, it's on loan to us for a, a little while here. It's a 5,000-year-old word. We've been using it for 18, and so we try to do it justice uh, in the way we do business. So we started off building purpose-built garments uh, designed for freedom of movement, hidden technical features, uh, and things that you could move and free, freely in to climb or do yoga in, and started to attract a young consumer that was looking for something different. You know, out there, and the clothes were, climbing clothes were peg-legged and shiny, and you know, the waist was about up to here. There wasn't a lot of good stuff going on. This is early 90s, so we, we kind of took a fresh approach to it. And uh, the important thing is we made stuff that was very durable and could withstand the rigors of the outdoors. So we started to attract some of the best climbers in the world, like this guy. And the best yogis, you know, like John, uh, involve them in product development, uh, which we still do today. Um, you know, a lot of people out there testing stuff, Chris, our yogis, I mean, always developing the products and making tweaks and changes to make them better. So it took us about five years of sustained focus on the yoga and climbing communities. We really didn't look out of there. We were just so immersed in those two conscious communities that Prana eventually became a household name in, in climbing and yoga. Shiva Ray, and then uh, out climbing, one of our favorite places, uh, Le Calanques, out in the south of France. Beautiful place to climb. So since then, the echo of our brand has reached out beyond just climbing and yoga to the general outdoor industry and then related lifestyle. And by related lifestyle, I mean people that are concerned about health, wellness, and sustainability. So we, people in, in the yoga and, and climbing communities had that going on. You know, they were, they, they were tuned into those frequencies. And, and now we're seeing more and more of these outer rings, uh, more of the general population is coming that way. So it's a similar uh, mentality that, that we saw 15, 18 years ago in climbing and yoga. So we got the business to a certain point where it was sustainable. It was, um, you know, we could pay the bills on time. We had some employees. We were growing. And uh, we started to ask ourselves questions like, how can we do more than just have a business for commerce? How can we use our company as a vehicle for positive change and do things that would inspire others. In the early days, we had fun with homespun ideas. Um, we, would, we would make our own uh, hang tags that went on the garment from uh, newspapers in the neighborhood. We'd gather everybody's uh, newspapers when they were done with them and put them in this huge blender we had, grind them up, make a pulp, put some pine tree scent in there, pour out the pulp on a little slab in the backyard, dry, uh, roll it out with a rolling pin, dry it in the sun, and uh, print it on it with water-based ink. And we tied it with a little hemp string and a safety pin, which we still do today on every garment to kind of to honor uh, our roots. And uh, it was a fun way to, you know, take these ideas of sustainability back then, put them on our garments, but they weren't scalable. So then um, a door opened for us. We were invited uh, up to the Organic Exchange about 10 years ago. This was up at Patagonia. And it was a group of about uh, 70 people. There was organic cotton farmers. There was people that were learning how to recycle uh, polyesters and nylons and things. There was vendors that made uh, sustainable goods, and they invited us in there as a brand. There was other brands there also. Kind of took us under their wing and said, uh, let's show you guys how to do this. We'd love your company to do, do this also. So it was a really uh, amazing experience to be in because all the barriers of competition came down. Even though we had competitors sitting right next to us, we're going to make the same goods, vying for the same dollars in the marketplace. We're kind of we're, we're involved in something bigger than all of us. And it was really exciting. It was like a, a family, and we had a, a new, newfound love so on the drive home from um, Ventura, it was about a three-hour drive, Pam and I got on the phone and we switched 19 of our conventional cotton styles to um, organic cotton. And so these were already sourced. They were in the hopper. They were getting made by vendors. And we used the sources we learned from the, uh, the meeting to uh, resource this stuff in organic cotton. Uh, it, was that, it had that much effect on us that we were making immediate change. 
We use pamphlets from, again, our competitors and uh, educated our employees, uh, our vendors. There's a lot of people that didn't know anything about organic cotton in our supply chain. We brought up to speed and kind of shared that with them, and they, they have since dove in and, and shared it with other industries. Took organic cotton farm tours just to learn about what happens when you put how much pesticides go into the ground. If we can choose organic, you know, it's that much better for the, the plants, the, um, the, the farmers picking it. Um, really, the, the whole team then kind of uh, took it in. You know, it came from Pam and I originally, kind of top down, but um, within a few weeks, the, the whole company embraced it. We had people in production figuring out how to save boxes. We had uh, our people in, uh, in the catalogs. Next one, please. Um, all of our paper products for about 10 years now have been done on post-consumer waste and recycled paper. So everybody, it was kind of like, um, yes, we had our company, but it was this, this energy around doing things in a more sustainable way. Our Prana Natural Power Initiative, a wind power program we, we um, introduced five years ago. Actually, we're celebrating it uh, in a few days at Outdoor Retailer, our trade show in Salt Lake City. Um, we uh, came in and said, okay, how can we take wind power, because Prana means breath and respiration, Let's, let's stand for one thing that we can be known for and be an authority on. So we, we learned a ton about wind power and we helped share it with a lot of other companies. But what we did is we, we made a, a deal with our dealers to where we got all their energy bills and on 400 of our dealers we took their, their base energy and we purchased wind power credits. So essentially it was more expensive. We paid the difference for all of them but essentially they could um, offset their power using their stores with wind power. And uh, it was a really creative program, took it to the end consumer even. Uh, at, at, uh, we had carbon calculators at climbing events where people could you know, come on this little computer in our booth and plug in their zip code and, and an idea of what their electricity bill is, say if I switched to wind power, how much would it cost and where would I go for that? And so we really brought it into, into the consumers. And uh, for that effort, um, the EPA awarded us with a uh, Green Power Leadership Award. It was a real proud moment. Our buddy DK was on stage with Pam and I. We were up there with uh, IBM and um, Whole Foods, Starbucks, you know, some really great companies. And you got this little garage company, Prana, up there with our plaque. It was, but it was a proud moment for us. It was great. So all, this, all these things really resonate with our, with our people, with our community, with our audience. You know, they're, they're out there doing uh, yoga, climbing. You know, they're they're uh, connected to the earth. They're, they're um, aware of the earth. And so these kind of business uh, core values and beliefs align with their personal values and beliefs. So for us running a business, which you have to always balance commerce with idealism, it makes sense because it's so much a part of our brand. At the outdoor retailer, like I was saying, the trade show coming up next week, it's been about a dozen years now, we do something called the Rejuvenation Room. And it's a place where we, we rent a, a separate uh, room in, in, right in the, in the hall so you can get away from the trade show lights go into the Prana Rejuvenation Room. It's got you know, candles going, a lot of beautiful pictures on the wall, 30, 40 yoga mats, different teachers throughout the day. We run four classes. It's a room where you can go take a nap. You can just uh, do meditation. We've got guided meditations through there. It's just for, for people as a gift, you know, anyone's welcome to come there and just rejuvenate. So it's been a nice way to connect yoga with the outdoors. And, uh, at our trade show, this is coming up, um, you know, there's our booth, we use all hemp ropes, and uh, you're very transparent, people can come through our booth at any point, see anything they wanna see. You know, sometimes trade show booths are like barriers and you can't get in, so ours is the opposite, come, everyone's welcome. Um, but the great thing is, is the idea of bringing yoga into the outdoor world. And 10 years ago in this hall, if you mentioned the word yoga, people would look at you because they thought it was some kind of religion or something. And now there's pretty much not a presentation going on that involves women's active or that they're not talking about yoga. It's, it's, uh, it's really come together. So things like bringing Chris here, you know, the best climber in the world, bring him to a place like Wanderlust, you know, where this is the center of yoga as far as I'm concerned. Um, Cross-pollinating those two cultures, you know, we shot a lot of footage with Chris on the mat. He was enjoying being surrounded by a lot of women and, and having a good time for sure. But the idea then is, is for prana when people think of, uh, in the outdoor world, they think of uh, prana, they think of yoga, and, and hopefully vice versa. So it's, for us, we've always been, since the beginning, weaving the two together. Just another shot of our, our booth there with our, with our clothes. And, you know, our culture is all about fun. That, that's one thing we've 
it's never felt like work for us. We, we started this business, we aligned it with our personal lives, you know, just passionate and totally in love with climbing and yoga. And, and so we're fortunate enough to build a business around that. And uh, we, we, we have good times at, at work. You know, Sarah is here, she works with us. She just started a few months ago, but um, we're, she's already fitting right in. We're having a blast together. Just a little wind power celebration there with Chris trying to spin the turbine. And uh, this is our CFO, Larry. So this is the most serious guy in the building. You know, a, uh, a CFO is supposed to hold the line. You know, we, we, get, we get all creative, we get out there, we're the ones that spend the money, and, but you gotta have a guy back there balancing the, the books. And so that's Larry, he has a good time too. Every day we uh, ring our gong at 2.45. It's a mandatory one minute pattern interrupt. You know, there's no working. Uh, if you're on a phone with a customer, that's an exception. But otherwise, pre pretty much people hit the floor, face up, face down, whatever. Uh, and it's just a nice way to just say, my job now is to not work, you know, for that one minute. And we have a joke, my good buddy DK, um, when we're at work, because he's, um, he's kind of a free spirit that moves in and out of our business. And uh, we say that one minute is when he does work. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween for us is a big, uh, big holiday for sure. You know, we, we, again, like to have a good time and always have spare, a uh, half dozen spare Halloween outfits in the trunk for those that didn't come prepared because you're pretty much not allowed working that day unless you're in costume. So. This is a funny slide, but it's, it's something that I've been, I came from the restaurant business, so it's, it's an analogy I use all the time with regards to service and, and seva. And in our business, you know, we're serving not only our customers, but we're serving each other. And so this analogy, people in the business have heard it for too long. But I, I just used it a few days ago again when we were designing hang tags and trying to take the easy way. So the analogy is this. You don't design a menu to please the cooks. You design the menu to please the customers, and then the cooks figure out how to make it. And too often, you know, in businesses, people want to take the shortcut. They want to, they want to say, okay, what's easiest for us? What's cheapest? What's quicker? And uh, we really try to immediately go right in the customer's shoes first. What's best for them? then let's engineer around how to provide that. So. And so that's all. So Prana, our company, has really kind of become my personal dharma. You know, it's been 18 years now, and uh, it's been such a journey uh, with the company and where it's taken us. You know, we, we started with this little idea, and it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough name to live up to. It's, uh, it's, it's helped guide us and keep us on the line there to, to respect that name, and uh, our goal is to continue to do that for a long time, so I appreciate you listening. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you can say more about that idea of cross-pollinating. Um, a lot of folks who are connected to an outdoor and simple lifestyle often don't interact in the sort of indoor and more establishment kind of arenas. And it's also really important for the message to sort of be spread and shared in the world to do that and it's a challenging it seems like very sort of different worlds in a way and I was just you seem to sort of work in that realm of kind of back and forth we've seen it change a ton like I was saying you know 10 years ago to to now and uh, we you know the the best climbers we've got baseball players now football players or yoga is being integrated in all kinds of things so it's it's no longer a religion or whatever people were calling it. Four years ago, though, um, our friend at, at uh, Gaiam, Yurka, he approached, it's actually five years now, he approached um, the people at Target and uh, to sell yoga mats to them. And they, they, their answer was, we don't do religious stuff. <laughs> and, and they're selling millions of mats a year now out of Target. So my point is, so many things, you know, that those barriers are all coming down. It's woven into so many lives now. It's not, you know, there's people, there's, 260 pound, you know, fullbacks doing yoga. Um, and so the idea behind bringing Chris in here was to now go with this kind of, uh, you know, put together viral videos that are, you know, a couple minutes long and feed all the climbing websites worldwide. So, you know, the most respected guy in the world is on a yoga mat, you know, and it's just, just what he's getting out of that and how similar it is to his practice of climbing uh, will now be shared with the world. So it's going to help. You know, that's one way. I mean, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things, but that's our way in this case. Just seeing opportunities and trying to connect with the people you're serving. Yeah, and using the great personalities we have. You know, I took John Friend climbing. I mean, we're, we're going to try and do, you know, and Shiva, I mean, she's a, 
She was going to go bungee jumping the other day. She did a rafting thing. She's an adventurer for sure. Yes, sir. It would have been nice to see more of your clothes here in men's sizes. You know, some, they're 200 pounders because there's a lot of small things and a lot of women's clothes. Good question. You know, in an event like this, it's about 75% women, so we, we definitely skewed our, our selection more towards women here. And we have opened up our sizing uh, in the last season, which will take effect uh, starting spring 11. Our, our, you'll see our men's sizes get bigger, and we're offering double XL in, in multiple styles now. But in general, you know, when we were focused on climbers and, and yogis, they were lean and fit and smaller people. Um, most good climbers, Chris is an exception, most good climbers are like 5'7". Five, nine, with small feet, less leverage, and they got these, you know, Chris is an exception to be over six foot and, and climbing like that. So in answer to your question, we're, we're moving in that direction. We've been hearing a lot of comments like that. What sort of market uh, penetration do you have in other stores? Do you run your own branded stores, and what store should I look for? Great question. Yeah, the, the, the majority of our wholesale business, 90% of it is the outdoor industry, which would be uh, big companies like REI, but mostly mom and pop climbing shops in, in places like here. You know, Truckee, we have a great store. So Little Mountain Towns is really where we're strong. The Rockies is our number one territory. Um, so really outdoor shops. Yeah, there's not really a, a substantial wholesale trade in yoga. You, there's no yoga. You know, there, there's got your little chains here and there, uh, yoga works, things like that. But it, it's not a sophisticated... Uh, based um, right now. We're in a couple hundred yoga studios and 1,400 outdoor shops in the, in the, in the U.S. and then 40 other countries uh, outside the U.S. I have one more question. Okay. How, about How do companies that are conscious uh, scale and remain true to their ideals? I mean, what are some of the sacrifices and trade-offs that you have to make and what kind of things have you run into as you've seen the brand grow? Yeah, excellent question. You know, it is always a balance, and, and now, you know, with Prana, we have, a, to help us grow, we have an investment firm, so my wife and I don't own the whole company now. We're partners with a firm, and so they have their own agenda. They've got a financial agenda. They, they bought into our brand, you know, Scott, our partner, was here doing yoga because he, he um, so he found us through yoga. It wasn't like I want to invest in that company. I love this brand and this company, what they stand for. Let's support them. Let's give them the resources to go to the next level. Um, so when you have a partner like that, it helps. But you always have that balance. You know, we've got the, the thing where, hey, we want to make this product out of organic cotton. But it's going to be 85 bucks. Our, our uh, competitors with the same features, you know, a bigger brand in the outdoor industry is doing it for 70. It really comes down to the consumer in the end. Is the consumer educated enough to reach in their pocket to say, I'm going to spend the extra to have a more sustainable item or fair trade or whatever it is versus just mass produced, you know, somewhere else. So. Um, we, can do, uh, we can do only so much, and in the end, it's the consumer that has to make that decision. I mean, you talk about, like, Diam making the decision to, like, go into Target. Mm -hmm. and scaling and, and is really important in terms of being able to spread the consciousness at large. Um, you know, and I've heard Gary Hirschfeld talk about Stonyfield and, you know, going into Walmart. You know, mm -hmm. what's your feeling about going, you know, taking Cron into big boxes? Is that somewhere where you want to go, or do you feel that that's not a trade off you would make, or having that kind of exposure helps push the general consciousness forward? Uh, good one. Um, our plan for Prana is really not to go to more big box, you know, because for us it's not so much the quantity of goods we sell, but it's, it's even the way that people um, discover our goods. You know, they're, they're here, or they're in a mountain town, and, you know, in, in wonderful states, they just went climbing. And come on. So there's the Discover Prana, and it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's um, more of an emotional connection to a brand versus, hey, I got this thing that covers my body. You know, there's, so it's, it's deeper than that. But we, um, distribution for us will be through our web, uh, the biggest growth, and we're, we're doing probably the most sustainably produced catalog, well, the one that we can. Um, to reach people that are like-minded. So what we've done is we've done a lot of customer surveys over the last couple of years to understand the demographics and psych psychographics of our people, our people meaning yoga and climbing, where it really has been, understanding what brands they like and you know, how, how much money they make, what, what their education is, and, and taking that data and psychographics, what they care about, and, and overlaying it with databases. Uh, place, um, there's, there's big database companies where you can grab that data. So we, uh, Abacus is the one we're using. 
So basically we have a, a match on 95% of that criteria of all those things that people are, you know, they care about organic cotton. They, they're active this much, they're educated. And we take that, that grid of information and we overlay it on their database of 70 million names. And what we found out in the last six months is there's four and a half million people in their database that think very similar to the way the people that do in yoga and climbing. And so that's how we're going to grow our company, talking to those people. Those are the outer rings. Maybe they've done yoga once or twice or climbed a few times or don't even care about that, but they're thinking the same as a like-minded individual that, that we want to attract to our brand. Through what channels of distribution do you think that is attainable? And because you've already tapped the outdoor market, there's only so many stores like that mm -hmm. around. Is your place to grow in a lifestyle clothing more than your performance clothing? That's where we've seen our biggest growth for sure. You know, people, even in our surveys, we find out that people, are, more people are using our stuff for everyday lifestyle than they are actually on the rock or on the mat. You know, because you're only doing that a half dozen hours a week or whatever. They're, people are living in them. They're going to work in them. They're, they're you know, out, out living in them. So that is our biggest opportunity. But continue to throw anchors all the time to make the best climbing stuff for Chris, to make great stuff that John and Shiva can wear on the mat that's performing. But the biggest part of our line, for sure, will be the casual stuff. Not this 70s pilot shirt that was a dollar at the... <laughs> <laughs>